En route, the ship was captured by the Southern Navy, who then killed the crew, leaving just two people to steer it and Tillman, who was told that he'd be sold as a slave. So that night, he sneaked into the Southern captain's room and killed him, then killed his second-in-command and then seized the revolvers. Then he drove the Confederate crew below deck, put them in irons, released his two colleagues and turned the ship back to New York, where he was greeted by a crowd of thousands as a hero. During this time, Harriet was employed to operate behind enemy lines in South Carolina as a spy. For Harriet to take control in the way that she did was remarkable, given that a few years earlier she'd felt unable to eat in front of white people. The actions of former slaves transformed the war and Lincoln changed his mind entirely and insisted on forming black regiments. The first was to be set up by Thomas Higginson, who'd been one of John Brown's co-conspirators. And his first mission was to capture the South Sea Islands off South Carolina. And he summons Harriet to be his advisor. South Carolina was the staunchest Confederate state of them all, owned by families such as the Middletons, who'd made millions from rice plantations. The plan was simply to steal as many slaves as possible in one go and then sail them up the river. Once the slaves were on board, according to one Confederate witness... A group landed at Mr Middleton's and in a few minutes his buildings were in flames. On that night, 750 slaves were rescued and the Confederates blamed each other. According to an official report... We allowed a parcel of Negro wretches calling themselves soldiers to march unmolested and burn a large section of the country. Through incidents like this, the nature of the war became completely different from when it began. A bureau of coloured troops was set up and 179,000 slaves fled the plantations to fight against their former owners. Harriet changed her opinion about Lincoln. He issued the Emancipation Proclamation that abolished slavery in all territory that was captured. Sheets with the proclamation on were printed and the first batch was taken by a black pastor to a huge platform erected for a rally but he'd run a mile to get there, and now he was so exhausted that he had to pass the proclamation on for somebody else to read it out. The pastor said that people were so excited. Men squealed, women fainted, dogs barked, songs were sung, and cannons was fired. Soon after came a battle involving one of the most famous regiments in the war, the 54th Massachusetts, which is celebrated in statues such as this one in glorious, even rainier Syracuse. The 54th Massachusetts was an entirely black regiment except for the white abolitionist commander and they were sent into one of the most daring missions in the war, the capture of a fort in Virginia. They fought spectacularly and according to the Atlantic Monthly... Through the cannon smoke of that dark night, the manhood of the coloured race shines before eyes that would not see. Harriet was assigned to be the regiment's nurse, although half the soldiers had been killed. Word of the battle spread across the north and for the first time ever, the Medal of Honour was awarded to black soldiers. Ex-slaves and abolitionists now held crucial influence in the North, and Lincoln himself became a committed abolitionist. He insisted that a black regiment should capture Charleston, the capital of the Confederacy, and extract the final surrender. One account recalls how a black man knelt in front of Lincoln to thank him, but Lincoln replied... Don't kneel. You don't have to do that anymore. You must kneel to God only. A few days after the war, Abraham Lincoln went to the theatre and was assassinated by John Wilkes Booth, who was connected to angry Confederates. After the war, Harriet moved back to Auburn, largely because of William Seward, the New York governor and abolitionist who'd hidden dozens of slaves here in his house. He also lent Harriet the money for her own house round the corner and didn't seem to expect repayment. She moved in with a soldier called Nelson, who was 22 years old, about half of her own age, who she'd met while he was fighting in South Carolina. Now, in the South, the period after the war was known as the Reconstruction. And during the 1870s, 15 black congressmen were elected in the South, and segregation was made illegal. Pack up your troubles in your own kit bag and smile, smile, smile. Now, this is quite important because it means that after the Civil War, even in the Deep South, not all white people were racist. Although it's true that things did revert back to the extent that a hundred years later, in some states in the South, even black and white people's blood was kept segregated in the hospitals. 
which meant you must have had white people in places like Alabama going, you, you count the mixing with the integration of the, of the interracializing putting together with, with, with the blood because you've been running the risk of making us white folks less intelligent. The problem in the South was that the old order regrouped. The Ku Klux Klan was formed to terrorise black people back into isolation. And one victim in Baltimore was reported in a newspaper article that was forwarded to Harriet. A coloured man named John Tubman was shot and instantly killed yesterday by a white man. The murderer was acquitted by an all-white jury and Harriet never mentioned her ex-husband again in public. Following his murder, she married Nelson and for a while they lived off the proceeds of her autobiography, which she'd recited to a friend as she still hadn't learnt to write. She turned her house into a refuge centre, especially for orphaned children, but wanted to create a home for old destitute blacks, which she would call the John Brown Hall. To start with, she needed some land, so she went to auction and, she said... I bought it for 1450 and when asked how am I going to pay, I said I'm going home to ask Jesus for it. Then William Stewart died. As well as mourning her friend, this also meant she had to pay back the money she owed, which turned out to be exactly the same amount as what she'd been paid for the autobiography. At one point, she couldn't pay her taxes, so she paid with a cow. <laughs> Altogether, it was 30 years before she was granted a regular soldier's pension. So when the John Brown Hall for Destitutes was eventually opened, she was nearly 90 and had to move in herself. Hey, yo, 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 MTV! Welcome to the John Brown Hall, my crib! Check this! Nothing. And eventually she died in 1913. The same year that Rosa Parks, the woman who started the civil rights movement when she refused to sit at the back of the bus, was born. Now she's a celebrated figure throughout much of America, although she never won round everybody. In the 1990s, Lynn Cheney, wife of the vice president, made an official complaint about Harriet's name being taught in schools, saying that this was due to political correctness. If she'd been alive during the Civil War, she'd have been a phone-in host. And what about this latest plan, dreamed up in some town hall somewhere to abolish slavery, huh? Now you can't even whip your own property. What is going on? Give us a call. More common are these people who love Martin Luther King and Nelson Mandela and Muhammad Ali and say, oh, wasn't it dreadful that people used to say that blacks were lazy and filthy and dirty? And wasn't it appalling that they used to say that the Irish were lazy and filthy and dirty? When now we know that it's asylum seekers who are filthy, sponging, disease spreading mongrels. Do you know there's 30 million of them coming next week? The story of Harriet Tubman is the tale of a woman who fought against an axis of evil to strike a blow for freedom. She would tell the slaves that she was helping to escape. If you're tired, keep going. If you're scared, keep going. If you're hungry, keep going. If you want to taste freedom, keep going. But she wasn't just someone who helped slaves to escape. She also showed that people who are kept as far down as possible so that they don't even own their own bodies can still change the world. To the extent that one ex-slave, on the day of emancipation, addressed a northern army camp by saying, Once the time was a cried all night. The next morning my child was to be sold, and she was sold, and I never expect to see her till the day of judgment. Now, no more of that, no more of that. With my hands I was going to work when my overseer whipped me along. Now, no more of that. They can't sell my wife and child no more. We're free now. Bless the Lord. Oh, what a If you fancy emancipating yourself from mental slavery, why not log on to open2.net?